So let's analyze this rocket motion. Now, when we look at the motion on a graph, we get that the first part of the graph is a curve, which indicates acceleration, which is expected. And we have a sharp curve upwards, which indicates that it's a great amount of acceleration upwards. And then followed by what looks like a straight line, but is actually a small part of a very large parabolic curve opening downwards. That would indicate the, the time in which it was in free fall. And when we look at the velocity time graph, during the thrust we see a very steep line, which indicates a very great amount of acceleration, which we would expect. And um, interesting thing, you can see exactly where the thrust stops, exactly where it runs out of fuel. And then for the rest of the time, it's um, a more shallow slope downwards due to the acceleration from gravity. And if you compare those two slopes, I get about four or five times as steep when you compare the, the steepness of the thrust upwards to the steepness of uh, free fall downwards. But um, more interesting than these two segments of the graph, I think, um, if you look at the very beginning of the graph, I'm more interested in why does it curve there. And what we call a, a curve on a velocity time graph, what that means is that acceleration is changing, and that's called a jerk. So I want to know why there's a jerk. To understand why there's a jerk at the beginning, we kind of have to look at the fact that we are not only thrusting the rocket upwards, but as we're doing so, we're expelling matter out of the rocket, making the rocket lighter, and thus we have less mass to move. And as we're expelling water downwards, we're also expanding the gas chamber of what's left inside the bottle. And uh, that has an effect on the, uh, the pressure that's inside the bottle. That goes down a little bit as we expand, um, but it's a much bigger effect that uh, we tend to be losing rapidly losing mass of water. So let's take the entire bottle, call it volume V. We'll split it up into um, two-thirds V and one-third V. Um, one-third of the volume would be filled with water and that's what's going to be expelled out. And uh, let's take a look at our useful formulas. Pressure by definition is force over unit area and by the ideal gas law pressure equals nRT over V. Another useful formula we're going to need is Newton's second law, F net equals MA. And for this situation, the force upwards, force thrust, FT, and uh, downwards we have the weight of what's left. Now that weight is going to be, um, it's kind of negligible, but not completely. We're going to analyze this as though the weight is negligible, and we can revisit it later, but uh, the thrust is much more of a force, uh, so we're going to uh, look specifically at the thrust. Okay, so as we're losing mass, mass times acceleration will always be changing because mass is a function of time. So how are we going to understand mass as a function of time? We're going to have to integrate. So we're losing these little tiny pieces of mass, I will call them dm for diddly mass, diddly amount of mass, very tiny amount. And um, the amount of mass that we're going to have left in the bottle should be the total mass m minus the integral over dm of how much mass has left the bottle. So now that we have a function for mass, we can plug that back into our Newton's second law formula, f equals ma, where for m, we're going to plug in big M minus the integral dm. And on the other side of the equation, we've got pressure and area. So nRT over V times the surface area of the liquid, which would be in a cylinder, pi r squared would be the surface area of that circle. So next thing we got to worry about is the volume. 
So v actually does change with time as well. So v is the volume of the gas, which is the, the pressurized gas that's pushing the water out. We started with two-thirds of the, um, the chamber filled, but as we're losing mass, we're going to be gaining uh, some space to put more volume in. So the volume total there should be two-thirds v plus whatever we've gained, we're going to call integral dv over the same um, limits that we've lost mass. Now let's take a minute to define our dv and our dm. dv, you can think of it as a very small amount of volume, and we're going to split it up into slices of the cylindrical reservoir of water, if we take one very, very thin slice of that, it's going to have an area of pi r squared, and it's going to have a very, very small height we will call dz. Teeny, teeny, tiny amount of z. And the volume of that very thin slice of water can be um, base times height, which is um, pi r squared dz. And by base, I mean the area of the base. Now, what are we going to call dm? Well, dm would be the tiny amount of mass that's ejected um, when that thin slice of water gets pushed down. So, it's going to basically be the, the density of the water times the volume of water removed. So, we'll keep the dv, and then we'll multiply that by density, because as you know, by definition, density is just mass over volume, or in this case, dm over dv. Well, what is the density that we're going to be using for this water? Well, since we've got all of the mass located in one-third of the entire volume v, we could say that the density, then, is 3m over v. So let's just summarize these two integrals for volume. We've got the integral over dv, which is just pi r squared dz. And for mass, which tells us how much mass we've expelled, is density times that volume. So rho dv, which would be rho pi r squared dz. So let's plug those back into our original formulas for, um, for v and for m and then we'll simplify and uh, we'll rewrite this whole equation for A. Let's take this a step further and get our actual um, limits and our actual solutions to those integrals. So for volume, over the um, volume limits we get uh, pi r squared z as a solution to the integral going from 0 to z. And then likewise for m, the integral dm, we get rho pi r squared z over that same limit. So let's plug those solutions back into our expression for a, and let's also substitute our density um, as 3m over v. And now we have an expression for a that tells us the acceleration at any given instant. Now let's revisit our volume formula for a cylinder if the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared times h, I'm going to do a little math trick here. Um, and I'm going to multiply this entire acceleration expression by the quantity h over h, which is just 1. And what's going to happen is every time now that we have a pi r squared h, we have cancellation and we can really just call that v. And then that really cleans things up a little bit because we can um, eliminate some v's and we can simplify our expression and now we get an expression for acceleration is proportional to the square of h and also the square of z which is the um, specific amount of water level we have left so as the water level approaches zero as we expel it all out, then our denominator gets much, much smaller. And as you guys know, when the denominator gets smaller, our value for our function of a must get bigger and bigger. So that is why we have a jerk.